Tony Walby. How you doing? I am great. Yourself? I'm doing well. Spoke to you the last time. I, I've interviewed you so many times over the last couple of years. And uh, I just wanted to follow up to see, uh, you know, what, what you're up to these days. Because I see you on uh, social media and you're, you're quite active uh, in, in various aspects of uh, the, the, the sporting community, be it judo and um, the different aspects of uh, the administrative and and you're also on the mats regularly just just give us a summary of what you've been up to since uh, our last conversation post uh, brazil well i'm i'm still coaching and teaching judo at, at a high level i teach uh, seniors and kids uh, by seniors that's anybody over 16 and um, i started teaching the children's class which are uh, three four five six year olds and then the seven eight nine ten year old class uh, mainly because my kids are in those two classes. Uh, within the uh, sporting community, um, I've been a member of the Canadian Paralympic Committee Athlete Council. This is my fifth year, and in December of last year, I was elected the chair of that council. So by extension, I am now on the board of directors of the Canadian Paralympic Committee as the athlete representative, and I'm off to a bunch of different conferences representing athletes at uh at the international level, uh, such as the World Anti-Doping Agency Symposium, the International Paralympic Committee Athletes Forum, the uh, the Canadian Safe Sport Summits that uh, are, have occurred over the last month and and uh, f end with next month's uh, National Summit, uh, and I am keeping my coaching education up to date by uh, online courses and through mentorship with uh, who I have always considered the best coach in the country, Andre Sadaj, with just the corresponding with him. And I guess some of the stuff that you've seen me active on social media about is coaching and teaching and the, the separation between coaching and teaching. Um, I've put out a few rants and a few posts over the last few months over that. Brilliant posts, by the way. I've, I've, seen, I've seen, I think, two of them, and they hit me, and I was like, wow. What's going on there? This is really a. It's very informative for for someone like myself who follows the, you know uh, various combat sports. It's always insightful to hear from uh, from from coaches and, and and competitors to to hear their insight. Can you elaborate as to uh, in, in in regards to those posts? What a motivated them? Give us the context and b. What is it? What will it take to address these issues? Well, the first post that I, I put out a few weeks ago. Uh, was a result of an, MMA, an MMA fighter putting out um, a video on how to do Osoto Gary, which is uh, a very popular and uh, strong technique in judo. And he was explaining how to do this in this video, and it was 100% opposite on how the technique was done. He even named the technique improperly. Um, uh, well, what, what, what did he name it? He called it Ass Soto Gary. Okay. It was, it was, there was a lot of joke posts put out about it in the judo community. And, but it was uh, viewed thousands of times. And my worry is these videos such as this one that show techniques that are judo techniques done improperly. This one was done it would be dangerous to do. If you were to attempt to do this the way he showed it being done, if you were to attempt to do this, you would injure yourself or you would uh, get injured by being countered pretty hard. And I, that started off my rant on, this is not the only video I've seen of the sort. I've seen lots of uh, mixed martial arts videos and Brazilian jiu-jitsu videos that are showing judo techniques done improperly, done unsafe, and the masses are seeing these videos and thinking, oh, this is judo. This is how I do this. And if you have an inexperienced judoka and an inexperienced instructor that is monitoring the judokas in the class and they're trying these techniques, I'm not saying that the instructor is teaching them. I'm saying they've seen these videos and they're attempting to do these techniques and the instructor is not uh, correcting them uh, due to inexperience or or just not noticing it, uh, injuries can occur. And I, I think it's it's very uh, dangerous to have these videos out there and that uh, strong coaches and strong uh, competitors need to point out 
these these videos when they see them and and in the comment fields and uh, if they're being shared to base to say that this is unsafe, this is wrong, do not do this, and that fired off my first post. Um, my second post in the last couple of weeks was a a, a rant on coaching and instructing, the separation between coaching and instructing and the amount of unqualified instructors and coaches that are teaching judo and coaching judo that are popping up a lot in small tournaments, in bigger tournaments, uh, clubs that are popping up that are allowing uh, brown and black belts to teach that do not have proper certification or proper methods of teaching or have been taught how to teach. They're just, this is how you do judo, and they're doing uh, things, again, that are unsafe, that are too advanced for the uh, the level of students that they have, and it's hurting me, it's hurting judo, and it's hurting judo through these athletes, it's hurting judo through the reputation of judo, and the quality of the brand of judo in Canada. Whenever you do a technique, the object is to... Uh, well, judo. Judo is a gentle way. But y- if I'm doing a standing technique to throw you, right. I want to throw you with control, mm-hmm. with strength, with power. But you want to be able to do the break fall, to do a good landing, to be safe. Right. And there is when you do a technique, it's for both tore and uke, so the sure. attacker and the defender. Right. You really don't want to do a technique that's maybe safe for the attacker but unsafe for the defender. Mm-hmm. Um, you won't have many partners. Right. And, and, and the issue, th- thank you for that explanation. O- on top of that is you're saying that there needs to be an active way to kind of call this nonsense out by, by credible members of that community who actually are certified as, as coaches and subject matter experts. Well, exactly. And, and while doing this, it's also a good to point out where uh, athletes can go, where judoka can go to see quality videos, to see quality techniques being done and in that post that i put out uh, i i actually put uh, a few places where they could go to actually see really high quality judo being done that is i don't want to say simple but is easy to understand and easy to follow and shows proper technique and proper safety with judo at all levels uh one of those instructors um, out of the united kingdom is neil adams Fighting films, I believe it is. Uh, effective is. fighting. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and, and their series of instructional videos are probably the best out there. W- wouldn't you say? I mean, like just the... the no, they're, they're very, very high quality. And the uh, detail on the instruction, the way they break down the simplest grip to and how elaborate they get it, it it's mind-blowing and it shows the complexity and the art of, of the sport. Well, Neil Adams is an amazing coach amazing instructor and I'm, I'm going to say was an amazing fighter but uh, the video he put out yesterday shows that he's still an amazing fighter um, it, judo is, is is not always about the strongest guy it, it, it is about technique position and understanding of basic fundamentals and if a coach or an instructor has the understanding of the basic fundamentals of judo um, their credentials as a fighter are are not necessary it's it's their ability to pass along how the 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 fundamentals uh are done so you don't have to be a former olympic champion or world champion to be a good instructor you just have to have an understanding of the basic fundamental movements of judo and you have to be able to relay that understanding to your students now moving on to the second post which is related to to what you're talking about here can you for, for listeners who may not understand, what is the difference between a coach and an instructor? An instructor teaches students how to do the techniques, how to do judo, how to, uh, from the very beginning, how to fall down, how to uh, do the different tachiwaza standing techniques and niwaza ground techniques and kumikata, the different grips. That's an instructor. An instructor is a teacher. A coach... A coach grabs that student that has the technique and makes them into a fighter, makes them into a competitor, takes all of the work that they do on the mat, 
from sparring, randori, to off the mat weightlifting, to nutrition, to their yearly planning, to how they're going to peak, um, has them prepared for competition with strategy. So the coach does all of the on and off the mat work with a competitor. An instructor teaches somebody the techniques of judo. And you're saying in your second post that there's a lack of, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but from, from what you're saying, there's a lack of quality instructors slash coaches or instructors posing as coaches or non-judokas, uh, you know, sitting as pretend coaches. What, what exactly? Okay, so my second post, there is not a lack of quality in, in judo in Canada. That's that's not what that post was about. It, sorry, in terms of instructing no, no, and coaching. No, and, and that's what I'm saying. So no, there's not a lack, but there are some people popping up that are teaching that are not qualified instructors. They're not uh, pushing through good, strong judo. They're not showing the fundamentals. They are, I, I think the last line of my post was, uh, a black belt doesn't make you a sensei. Uh, a black belt does not make you an instructor. And what you need to do to become an instructor, um, well, in Canada, you, you need to have your national coaching certification. Uh, there are five levels in Canada. Uh, the first two are the ones that are accessible to everybody and the ones that should be, uh, when I say accessible to everybody, accessible to everybody that is uh, a brown belt and above and over the age of 15. They are level A. It's called a uh, dojo assistant. And that basically shows you how to teach, how to show the fundamentals of judo. And then the level B is dojo instructor. And that one helps solidify how to teach the techniques in judo and to run a class and the importance of warm up and the importance of cool down and the structure of how to structure a class, how to keep the attentions of the students. Um, it, it shows all of that. It also shows many different techniques on how to actually teach. The levels above level B, uh, level three, four, and five are deal with coaching and start to deal with high level coaching. Level three is for national level coaches and above. And then a level four or five is a university level course, which develops professional coaches. So level three and level four or five are not accessible by everybody. There's very specific criteria to get enrolled in level three and beyond. So what I'm saying is all instructors should strive for level A and level B and continue their education, which is a lot of courses after that that they can take um, on the different protocols, like concussion protocol, teaching kids with a disability, um, gender equity in sports. There's so many courses that they can take to keep their instructor knowledge current. And then the high, high performance coaching is three, four, and five. So what I'm saying is that there are a lot of instructors that are popping up in smaller clubs and some in larger clubs that don't have this certification. And then there are other um, instructors that are not teaching strong judo. They're teaching um, stuff that they've seen in these videos. And they're teaching the attitude of win at all cost to um, a much younger audience that does not need to win at all cost. And I'm seeing this at uh, at the grassroots level, and it's it's not something I'm seeing in my own community necessarily. It's something I'm seeing through social media as well, through collaboration with other co coaches around North America. And I'm not the only one ranting about this, but I am pushing coaches in my community and coaches in Canada to really uh, continue their NCCP education. And I find that very, very important. On the coaching side of it... NCCP stands for National Coaching... Certification Program. It's run by the Coaches Association of Canada. Which, which governs coaching in, in Canada, yeah. Exactly. So on the coaching side of it, 
uh, some of the things I'm seeing at some of the tournaments that I attend, uh, I'm seeing coaches that are not certified, level A or level B, and they're, uh, they're doing things that are not good for judo. They're, they're, they're screaming at their athletes. They're um, causing commotions. They're, they're doing unsportsmanlike activity that is an embarrassment. Um, I can give you a specific example from the Liberty Bell competition last year in Philadelphia in the uh, U15, uh, U16 division. I was coaching one of our athletes, and the match right after this athlete's match, there was um, a coach from one of the uh, New England states that uh, was screaming at um, an athlete that I believe was in either the U10 or the U. Uh, 14 division he was screaming at him in a foreign language but the uh, we were able to get the gist of it because it was this athlete came off the mat in tears and the coach just kept right on him to where the tournament director came up and told him he would have to stop or leave and this is not an isolated incident we I've seen this um, well throughout my judo career I've seen this with coaches but in the last couple of years, I've, I've been noticing it more, and it's, it bugs me. Uh, I think maybe it's because I now have two young children in the sport, and I could never um, see myself behaving that way towards those, those two or towards any um, student at that level. And I've never coached that way, so I, I, I've never done that. I've never yelled at an athlete uh, if I've ever had anything to say to an athlete that was negative, it was always in private, and it was always to try to correct the the behavior of that athlete and, and correct whatever mistakes were happening. Um, I I feel positive coaching is is the only way to coach. You need to point out when an athlete does something wrong, whether it's on the mat, off the mat. You need to help correct those behaviors or those techniques, but it can be done in a positive way. That's really interesting. Um, you know, it, it could go, going back to, to the point in, in regards to the, you know, getting certified a, as a coach, level one, level two, and, and so on and so forth. These sorts of discussions, uh, as someone who interviews coaches uh, involved in other combat sports, some of these other combat sports, as you know, Tony, don't even have these, are, are not even considering these formal coaching uh, standards, you know. And in regards to to that incident, that that situation with it, where the coach is yelling at his uh, at the competitor there, when I was in in Dusseldorf uh, for the Grand Prix in 2015, for uh, I, I was there, you know, for for the documentary I'm working on, I was capturing some footage. I got you know behind the scenes sort of access. I did see some coaches from other, uh, you know, it's a global sport, so you see coaches from all over the world, and you see different cultures, different styles, different. I, I suppose uh, perspectives on things, and I saw some coaches. Like this one athlete was in the corner rocking. I'm not kidding. Back and forth, crying. She was a female athlete, and her coach, who had to be, I don't know, six six, maybe three hundred and thirty pounds, maybe an ex competitor himself, very big, strong looking uh, coach, yelling at the top of his lungs waving his hands like a madman and and i'm seeing this it's right out in the open in the corner in the back and you just feel terrible for her for for that competitor obviously she probably lost or you know she 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 didn't perform as well she could have performed but see what you're talking about though is the other end of the spectrum though grand prix um this is the ultra high performance I mean, these coaches are professional coaches. They're they're actually paid coaches. That they're 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 national team coaches mm -hmm. for that country. And this athlete, this is their livelihood. Sure. And I'm I I'm not going to say that I would condone that behavior, but that behavior at that level um, is is common. It is common. I've 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 seen it, and I've been on the receiving end of it, uh, but. It's again. That's a much different uh, example 
than the ones that I'm I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of more now. On the we're talking. Side. We're talking children. We're talking yeah. teenagers. We're talking uh, like Medunsha, like white, yellow, orange, uh, green belts. We're not talking about you have just lost your chance to go to the World Championships or the Olympic Games. Uh, we're talking about you just competed in a local or state tournament and um, you're being berated on the side of the mat and you're between the ages of 9 and 16. That, to me, uh, is unacceptable. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that the international level, it, it should be acceptable. There are actually codes of conduct for coaches at the global scale. Um, and we've seen many coaches over the last few years be ejected from mm. Grand Prix, Grand Slams, Olympic, Paralympic Games uh, for that type of behavior. And it is being monitored at the international level. And coaches sign, uh, when they go to these competitions, they sign a code of conduct uh, agreement, as do athletes. But again, there's a lot on the line for those athletes and those coaches. Like that coach's job or that athlete's place on a team may be on the line where the kids level or the club level, there's nothing on the line. There really isn't. Um, They can say, well, club pride is on the line. Well, you know what? I have more respect and I'm more proud of, of the clubs in my area where whether the athlete wins or loses, they give 100%. And at the end of that match, they shake the hand of their opponent. They say, thank you. They say, good match. They come off. And if they've made a mistake or they lost a match due to a mistake, they come off and go, what did I do wrong? How can I change that? That is what I look for in my athletes and in other clubs athletes. And that's how we are going to become global giants in the sport again, is is through those types of attitudes. And whether on both the coaching side and on the athlete side. And now speaking of, of uh, becoming global giants, uh, you, you've been involved in, in this sport, judo, for, for 38 years now uh, as a competitor, a coach, supporter, fill in the blanks. You, you, you've covered the entire gamut of, uh, of, of experiences. Um, what's the state of uh, judo in Canada as far as the, the competition, uh, competitive stream? So at the national level, Uh, Very, very strong on the able body side. Um, Right now, like our women's team is very, very strong. In minus 57 kilos, we have two girls ranked in the top five in the world. Um, And we have other girls that are ranked in in the top 25 in the world in in all in the divisions. Um, On the men's side, we have very, very strong fighters in almost every weight class. Um... I think we have at least one fighter in the top 50 in every weight class. And um, in minus 81 kilos, we have two fighters in the top 30 that are very strong fighters in uh, Etienne Biard and in, uh, in uh, Valais- and Va- uh, Antoine uh, Valais Fortier. Yeah. Um, and I think the state of judo in, in Canada is very strong. Um, on the para side, uh, we have one very, very strong female athlete right now in Priscilla Gagne. She's ranked in the top three in the world. She took a bronze medal at the World Championships in November in Portugal. Uh, she's very, very strong right now. At during our junior ranks, we have a number of fighters that are taking medals at European Junior Cups um, on a regular basis. Uh, and at the grassroots level, I, I, judo tournaments are getting bigger. Uh, when you attend provincial judo tournaments, um, it is getting bigger and stronger. And judo here in Ottawa, uh, we have, over the last couple of years, have just groundwork tournaments for beginners uh, under the age of 12. And we maxed it out at 60 uh, competitors at a small club that we have. And we have to create a waiting list after the first 24 hours of registration. Like Judo in Canada is growing and it has a very bright future, as does coaching in Canada in judo. Um, I know I painted a negative picture, but um, those are. No, I, I wouldn't say you painted it. I, I think you, you're highlighting way you know certain gaps that probably you see 
as, uh, as, as issues that need to get addressed. And, and I, I, point actually, them, I point them out because I want them to be addressed and right. I want clubs to recognize this in themselves, mm -hmm. in their own club. Um, at my club, I, I try to push our people that we are going to have be future instructors into these courses. And over the last year, we've had uh, four coaches uh, certified in level A. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have a, a club that has to 250 members total, um, four new instructors in one year is pretty strong. What sort of feedback have you gotten from, from other coaches and, and, and other members of, uh, of the judo community nationally, regionally, so on and so forth in regards to, to these issues that you're, you've highlighted? Well, the people that give me feedback are the ones that are going, well, our club is doing this great. Keep pushing the word. Um, the it, it, the clubs that actually have the inexperienced or the uncertified coaches, um, I don't get much feedback from them because they're not self-aware. And that is the problem with some judoka. Uh, you mentioned a, a, a few minutes ago that uh, in other combat sports that when they get their black belt, they feel entitled to be an instructor. Well, there's a segment of judoka that feel that way too. And, and that's just what needs to be pointed out is that no, you're not an instructor just because you have that black belt. You need to learn to become an instructor. And I, I think the best story I can tell of that is I'm a level four coach. Um, I'm a former international competitor, national team member, national champion coached uh, athletes to qualify for the Olympics. I've coached uh, national athletes. I've taught adult classes. And then a few years ago, I started helping teach the P what we call our peewee class. So our three, four, five-year-old class. And I was blown away on how much I did not know. Interesting. Elaborate on that. What, 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 what did you discover? So when you teach adults and you teach teenagers, they have an understanding of what you're showing. So I can show a technique really fast and I can use um, adult language with them, not, not cursing, but uh, grab the lapel, grab the arm, uh, pull on an angle, sweep through the leg, throw. I say that to a four-year-old and when he's done making some silly noise, He's going to go, huh? So you have to learn how to communicate with these, with, with these young children. Um, you have to learn uh, different techniques of teaching. You can't spend a whole class on technique. You have to mix in uh, a few things that are going to be fun and exciting and keeps their, their attention. You have to uh, come up with new language for teaching, such as um, when you when you teach a kid, like grab their jacket right here. Uh, this is called a lapel. Grab their sleeve. Make sure you hold that sleeve. Now you see that window over there. I want you to step towards that window. All right. I want you to bring your leg right up in the air like you want to kick out that window, and I want you to throw that leg right back like you want to kick your own bum. And I just showed a kid how to do a soto Gary. So language like that, that I had to learn how to do. And mm -hmm. I mean, we are lucky at our club that the the instructor for that class is also a school teacher for primary school. So she's already used to um, having those conversations with children and teaching children and using the language of children. So I got to learn that through her. And it improved my teaching ability and improved my uh, ability to communicate with that age group. And I think that it's a learning experience that all instructors need to have. But if I were to take that entitlement part, I'm a black belt, I know what I'm doing, and teach that kid's class the way I teach the adult's class, by the end of the first month, I'll have no students in that class. Because the kids won't want to come back because they're not learning, they're not having fun, um, they don't understand what's being said to them. So... I will lose all my students where I can say right now that class at our club, that peewee class has lost zero students hmm. and we keep, 
we we run September to June for the for Pee Wees, and we have lost zero students in uh, in that class. Well, uh, it's phenomenal. Why don't you plug the the name of the dojo and uh, so in case people are interested uh, in. So uh, I I I I belong to Takahashi Martial Arts on Melrose Avenue. The reason I say the address is that there are two clubs in Ottawa that have the name Takahashi. Uh, there's Tina Takahashi Martial Arts on Maribel, but I teach at Takahashi Dojo on on Melrose. Right. And uh, now you've, uh, you, as you mentioned, in December, you were appointed... Appointed chair right. of the Athletes Council for the R- Canadian Paralympic Committee. Right. So uh, speak to us about this this uh, transition of sorts from, from competition to being involved in the major sports administrative advocacy end of things? So in Canada, we have two major bodies for uh, sport. We have the Canadian Olympic Committee for able-bodied sport, and we have the Canadian Paralympic Committee for Paralympic sports. Uh, These two organizations have boards of directors, and they each have an athlete's council. Uh, The Canadian Paralympic Committee, we call ours the Athletes Council. The Canadian Olympic Committee, they call theirs an Athletes Commission. It's the same thing. So every national sporting organization that has a Paralympic sport is allowed to nominate an athlete to run for election in the Athletes Council. There are seven members of this council, and all of the Paralympic, all the Paralympians that have competed in the last two Paralympic Games for Canada vote on the athletes that are been nominated to run for these positions. So we have a, a council of seven members. Of those seven members, then we have a chair and a vice chair. And those seven members vote on who they want to be their chair and a vice chair. And I was elected the chair. So by extension, being the chair of that council, I sit on the board of directors for the Canadian Paralympic Committee. And it requires a lot more understanding of global sport, of where Canada's place is in the global picture. So the Canadian Paralympic Committee on the summer side has two major games, the Parapan American Games and the Paralympic Games, and on the winter side, just the Paralympic Games. So we spend a tremendous amount of time uh, supporting the athletes in preparations for those games and doing all of the legwork, administration work, uh, tracking the advocacy uh, work. So as part of this council, I'm also our anti-doping specialist. So I attend all of the different uh, World Anti-Doping Agency symposiums, the Canadian Council on Ethics and Sports, Anti-Doping Working Group. I sit on that working group. And so I advocate on beha- be- behalf of athletes for um, these, during these groups. So it's, it is a lot of administration work. It's a lot of higher thinking. It's a lot of thinking outside of judo on other sports. And in the para world, it's a lot about accessibility and the different levels of accessibility for athletes. So within para sports, we have a number of different classifications of disabilities. Um, and then we have some athletes that are what we call high support needs athletes. These are uh, quadriplegic athletes that, uh, that need almost 24-7 attendance. And um, they are still athletes and they still compete in, uh, well, the only sport that quadriplegics compete in is is boccia. But we have a number of sports where uh, paraplegic athletes compete. And we have a number of sports where uh, visually impaired and blind compete. So it is very, very challenging for me to have an understanding of all the different classifications and advocate on their behalf at all the different levels. It's, it sounds remarkable. It sounds like there's, I mean, A, there's, it's an entire different bureaucracy, right? As far as the, the international, as, as you're describing, uh, where Canada sits internationally. There's so many layers when, when you speak of uh, anti-doping and, and knowing the sports 
and so on. Are you enjoying this this uh, opportunity to to dive into all these new kind of learning opportunities as a, as an administrator, former competitor? Uh, very much so. I mean, um, I think I'd, I'd use the, the term advocate more than I would administrator. Um, I'm an athlete's advocate now, and uh, I find it very, very rewarding and I love the 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 challenge and the and the learning aspect. Um, in this role, I've had some great mentors. The former chair of this council, who is also the chair of the International Paralympic Committee Athletes Council, Chelsea Goto, has been very very helpful, and uh, she she has really uh, mentored me in this role. And she's she's there as an advisor to me. Um, I text her whenever I have a little issue or question that uh, I want her perspective on. But the, the the big thing is to is learning about all these other sports and how they um, interact at the international level, and how the politics that some of these sports at the international level um, is involved, and and really the the thing that that really has me uh, motivated is the, the the push that Canada is a leader when it comes to Paralympic accessibility in, in sport and in daily life um we're one of the few countries in the world where we have an accessibility law um and we are at the forefront of of accessibility technology in north america and we are really um blessed that we have the equal opportunities uh that the disabled people have equal opportunities in our country to to do almost everything. We can't be discriminated based on our disability. So it's phenomenal. Now uh, speak to us. You've got a few. You're super busy, uh, man. I don't know how you do it. You know, you're you, you're a, you're a parent. You're you're a professional. Uh, you know, you, you work for the government, and now you're also equally involved in uh, on the advocacy uh, world as far as sports, uh, competitive sports, internationally, nationally, so on, and so forth. Speak to us about your upcoming uh, few conferences. I believe you've got a big one coming up soon. All right. Well, before I did that, you, you just said, how do I do this? Well, you know, I'm going to have to mention this of how I do it. And I think I've mentioned this every time we interview. Of course, yeah. I do, I'm able to do this because of my, my wife, Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Big shout outs yeah, to Jacqueline. I have to. I have yes. to. I, I have a, a phenomenal wife, Jacqueline Yost, that, that I would be unable to do any of the things I, was, I have done in the last decade without her. So, yes, a big shout out to her. And having said that, I'm making her a solo parent in the next couple of weeks because, again, you just mentioned I have two big conferences coming up. Uh, the Canadian Council on Ethics and Sports is hosting a two-day conference in Toronto um, at the end of April for match manipulation and ethics and sports. So I will be representing the Canadian Paralympic Committee at this uh, conference. And then a week and a half later, here in Ottawa, uh, the first week of May, there is the National Safe Sports Summit being uh, hosted by the uh, the Minister for Sports and Science. Match <laughs> manipulation. I mean, that's I that's not, as soon as I heard that, I'm like, wow. The the ethics there, the debates and exchanges. Ethics in sports is, I guess, everything I do today with 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 athlete advocacy and clean sport uh, rolls around ethics in sports. But the conference I'm going to next week on match manipulation, gambling in, in, in sports, that's new for mm, me. Mm-hmm. That, that's really new for me. And I'm, I'm, I'm going there with, uh, with open ears to, to try to pick up as much knowledge as I can on, on just what the issues are. Because um, when I heard match manipulation, the only sport that came to my mind was basketball. Mm. And, and I'm, of course... you're going to say pro wrestling. No, yeah, no. <laughs> No, but I mean, I, and again, point shaving, and that, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that's part of it, but I, I'm, I'm sure that's just the, the tip, and that's what all of us would assume right away is, oh, match manipulation. We're talking about a boxer throwing a fight or something. Right, right. I have no idea really uh, how broad or our, our, the scope of match manipulation is. So that to me is very interesting to to learn about, and and gambling in sports. Uh, in Canada, um, I know the OLT, uh, they have some uh, gambling, uh, OLC or whatever it's called, the Ontario Lottery Ontario. Corporation. Right. They they do put out uh, 
some 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 gambling for sports, but there's no bookmaking in Canada. So um, I'm very curious to hear what they have to say about that, and especially at the amateur level. Um, I know in the United States there is bookmaking for amateur sport, so I'm very curious to to hear about it in Canada. Um, other than that, I'm I'm really looking forward to the conference after that, the the Safe Sport Conference here in in Ottawa. Is there's been a lot of talk, and I'm sure you are going to ask me some questions in a minute, but I'll I'll supersede you and start talking about it now. Um, Safe Sport is. A little bit of a misnomer um, because when you hear about safe when you hear the word safe sport you're I think most people most laymen will go oh you're talking about equipment or you're talking about uh, rules and procedures during the sport so that the athlete or the kid doesn't get hurt what we're talking about when we talk about safe sport at a national uh, or provincial level is uh, a lot of the stuff that's happened in the news lately mm -hmm. uh, CBC did a big expose a few uh, about a month and a half ago on coaches that have been convicted of sexual abuse over the last 20 years in Canada. And um, so some of that has to deal with, with, with those aspects, the, the sexual abuse. Um, some of it has to deal with the bullying that occurs in sport between athletes and between coaches and athletes. Some of it has to deal with harassment in sport, with uh, ethics in sports when it comes to uh, performance enhancements when it comes to uh, pressure on athletes to compete when they're not in uh, in c competition ready. So whether they're injured or they're psychologically or physically not able to do something they're told to do, um, those aspects are are part of the summit, and it's going to be a, a very emotional for some people, Summit, and it's going to be a very uh, informative for some people. There's um, a study that's being conducted right now by the University of Toronto that's being called the Prevalence Study. It's uh, being done in partnership with Sports Canada and an organization called Athletes Can, which is uh, an advocacy group that represents all national level athletes. This, this study is being done only uh, against national level and former national level um, athletes, and it involves uh, all these different aspects of abuse, harassment, and bullying. So it's it the results of that will be released either before the summit or at the summit, and it's going to be eye opening and game changing for a lot of athletes, coaches, and organizations. These are very important issues. Sure. Safe sport is a very big issue in Canada right now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a number of athletes over the last few years that have come forward with their stories. The big one, Sheldon Kennedy, right. uh, Allison Forsyth, um, and they've told their stories in the media. But you, you must think that these athletes who were... Uh, Olympic level and NHL level athletes, they come forward because they're public figures. How many haven't come forward? How many stories have been buried? Mm -hmm. And and again, it's not just the 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 sexual abuse. It's also the the stuff that some sports think are just well. That's what occurs in my sport. That's normal. And um, such as the bullying, the harassment, the you don't get access to medical treatment until you're done uh, task A, B, and C, mm -hmm. this type of stuff. And you speak to some national level athletes and you, you talk to them in some of these sports and they go, well, no, that's just how it happens in our sport. And you're like, well, no, that's not how it's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. So we want it made aware and we want policies, um, procedure and education put in place to mitigate it, to stop it, and to deal with it. And again, this whole conversation circles back to coaching, to uh, certification, and like one of the first things you have to do when you become a level A certified coach is take a course called Making Ethical Decisions. Hmm. That's the, one of the very first things you have to do. Like it's it's as simple as that. Like learning how to make these decisions at the grassroots level 
so that they propagate up for when you are a high performance coach or a high performance instructor that that base that you've built um, is there. Hmm. Thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll definitely be talking again uh, soon. Thank oh, you very much. My pleasure.